Okay, so we're live, and thank you for joining us for another Hagley History Hangout. My name is Ben Spohn, oral historian at the Center for the History of Business Technology and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, during these history hangouts, we like to introduce you to some of the fascinating research being done using the historical collections at the Hagley Library, especially by folks who have used Hagley's library collections. One such scholar joining me today is Dr. Jessica Borge. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? Yes. Great. <laughs> so I should have asked before we started recording. Uh, Dr. Borge is a research associate at the Archives and Research Collections, King's College London, and a researcher in the private sector. And today we'll be discussing her book, uh, Protective Practice, Practices, A History of the London Rubber Company and the Condom Business. So Dr. Borge, thank you for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm very happy to talk to Hagley. So I guess the best way to get us started is, can you uh, walk us through your book and some of the places it goes? Sure. Well, um, my book, which is, as you said, Protective Practices, um, came out a couple of years ago, and it's basically a history of London's, well, England's most prolific condom manufacturer, which was the London Rubber Company, and they produced the Durex brand of condom, which is perhaps a little less known in the States, despite best efforts, but has been the most popular condom brand in Britain since about the 40s or 50s. Um, and I try to compile a history of their activity from when they were founded in 1915 through to when they started manufacturing their own condoms in the 1930s, through the war years when production just exploded and things went mad. Um, and then on the 50s, when they developed their technology and became automated. Um, and the main bulk of the book really ends in about 1965, which is the peak of the golden era for the condom in Britain, I think. Um, and I follow that through with a bit about the 70s, 80s and 90s, not, not as thoroughly because of, uh, because of source material and limits on time, but that's pretty much it. It's a chronology of, of this company. It's what they got up to business-wise, what they got up to tech-wise, the innovations they were responsible for and the huge issues they had with marketing their product and trying to understand the consumer. Yes, and this was such a, a fascinating read. I, I also have to ask out of uh, my own curiosity, what drew you to this research topic? <laughs> I get asked that quite a lot, actually. <laughs> um, I, was, I was doing research on the pill. Believe it or not, I was, I was doing research on the pill. That was my big PhD idea. So the Wellcome Library in London, which I'm sure you know, um, has a really good collection of advertising. So pharmaceutical doctors, medical advertising for the pill in the 60s. No one had really worked on it. So I came up with a PhD proposal to basically look at the advertising. It was a bit, it was a bit thin on the ground, my proposal, if I'm perfectly honest with you, but uh, I knew there was something in there. And um, I spent a few months getting to know all of the different companies who were involved in making and selling the pill in Britain in the early 60s, um, you know, what all the different nuances between the different types of pill they did and their different strategies for, for marketing them. And um, this particular pill kept popping up called Feminor. And Feminor was made by the London Rubber Company. And I knew that the London Rubber Company made Durex condoms because I'd looked at them briefly before. I couldn't find any material, but I, I just, Every time I went in there to look at, at those pamphlets and booklets and things, I thought, why? Why would a condom company make a contraceptive pill? It makes no sense to me. Um, and then that was it. I just, I was, I was like a dog with a bone. I wouldn't let go of, of it. And I changed the whole project. I wanted to know what this company was doing, who they were. There was just no information. I thought, that's it. It's my job to find out. So that's what I did. Yeah, the whole tone of the project completely changed after that. And, and it became, I guess you would call it a business history, but also driven by an investigation of public relations and media and all of the cultural problems they had around selling the idea of their product. 
So it started with the pill and worked its way backwards. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Seems to work out fine. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And one of the things you mentioned uh, as having been a research challenge as you were grappling with primary sources is that the London Rubber Company doesn't have its own proper archive anywhere. Well, I mean, it, it may do and it may not. And this is, this is something that I, sh I should have said at the beginning, really. I mean, one of the reasons there hasn't been a book on the London Rubber Company is because if there is an archive, nobody can get to it. So the current owners um, of the Durex brand, I mean, the London Rubber Company is just a holding company now. It's, it's not a real business now. So it's really the Durex brand name, which is owned by Reckitt Benkiser. Um, and they have a private archive um, up in the north of England. And I have not been able to ascertain one way or another um, even through my contacts, whether there is an archive of the London Rubber Company and whether anyone has access to it, I suspect that they don't have that much material. Um, I don't think that there is an archive of the London Rubber Company, um, but there hasn't that there is no big collection of, of material in one place. So I've, I've spent years chasing around, drawing bits together, um, trying to assemble a narrative from as disparate sources as I can think of. And, and I don't think it's worked out too badly, actually. I think I've got a pretty cogent narrative. There are definitely gaps. There are definitely holes. Um, but I think I've been able to draw it together pretty well. And of course, Hagley was a really important part of that for my work. What sort of materials did you find at Hagley? Well, it was the Ernest Dictor archive. So I didn't know for certain, I did not know for certain that Dicta ever had anything to do with the London Rubber Company, but I had a, I had a hunch. There's a, a book, The Persuasion Industry from the 60s. Oh no, The Hidden Persuaders. There's a lot of books about persuasion in, in the 60s. I think it was um, The Hidden Persuaders. Well, anyway, it was one of, one of those books. There's just a throwaway line in it about how um, a London contraceptive company um, was unhappy with some market research that it had and it, it didn't it didn't elaborate any more than that and I had heard of Dict and I thought mm, I wonder I wonder so this is quite a few years ago it's about seven years ago I think uh, maybe longer maybe eight or nine years ago actually um, but I, I contacted Hagley I spoke to Lucas Clawson who's just fantastic um, it was before this stuff was digitized. It wasn't as accessible back then. Um, and I, I, I managed to find that indeed Dicta had done some studies for the London Rubber Company and other contraceptive companies in the States. Um, I don't dedicate a huge amount of time to it in the book. It's one chapter, but actually that material was really pivotal to my understanding of what they were doing and what kind of strategy they were trying to use, particularly at that moment when the, the pill came out. So I, I went back, I went back to that Dicta report again and again and again, and I reread it over the years and tried to understand it. And whenever I found something new from another source, you know, I'd bring it in, I'd compare it, I'd think about it. Um, so that particular report was, yeah, it was, it was really pivotal. So thank you, Hagley. <laughs> so I know we're getting uh, a little bit outside the confines of your text, but uh, what was, were, were the US and UK similar at this time, different? Uh, in terms of? In terms of what you found in the Dictor report. Um. Yeah, I, I would say so. I mean, um, the, the history of contraception, um, I mean, it's changing now. It's changing a bit now. There's a bit more British stuff on the scene. But for a while, the history of contraception has basically been dominated by American voices. And there's an American narrative of women's liberation and the particular types of contraception that we used. And um, you can't really apply that very easily to the British picture because they're very different places, different um, I mean, the societal norms are completely different. The sort of facilities that ordinary people have at home to use this stuff 
is very different in the mid 20th century. And you've got advertising regulation, which is very different as well. Um, so they're not really comparable in that sense. But what is interesting from the dicta research, and who knows, you know, this might just be the, the, the shtick that the dicta office came up with. We don't know for 100% that it's, it's, it's real or accurate. That's the nature of motivational research, right? But one of the parallels with the American research, so um, uh, Dicta did research for Young's rubber company who produced Trojan condoms for the American market and also a few companies that made spermicides as well. And what they found with those sets of research and the research for London rubber company is the authority of the medical voice, that customers respect the medical voice. And that if you want to start advertising this stuff, particularly to consumers, it's best to it's best to really avoid making it seem like a consumer product, even though that's what it is. Bring the doctors in. People like the doctors. They don't like condoms as a consumer product. Avoid that. And so, yeah, that, that's definitely a parallel with the American research. And that's borne out when you look at, when you look at the marketing, marketing material for, from both countries for any sort of contraception, really. All right. Was there any uh, push and pull too at that time? Well, I guess this would have been earlier with, uh, as you'd mentioned, that uh, some of the earlier condoms lasted months versus single use. Was there any push and pull during, uh, for that change? Well, perhaps I should just um, clarify for your listeners exactly what we're, we're talking about here. So, um, I mean, my, my book is really about the modern single use disposable condom that we all know and love you use it once it's gone you don't have to think about it again and condoms weren't always that way they were not always that way so condoms have gone through many different types over the years so that's if we just go back 300 years you had skin condoms and I'm pretty sure that some of those were reusable but it, you know, it would have been a bit difficult but they were made out of animal skins then you get um uh, the vulcanization of rubber coming along in the 1840s um, or thereabouts. And that changes the way that you can use rubber. It's got memory. Um, you can use it in industry. It was important in the steam industry, for example. You know, you can make specified shapes out of it in a way that you couldn't really do before. So once vulcanized rubber comes in, um, that changes things and it starts to be applied to medical appliances and contraceptive appliances start evolving. Um, so you have things like cervical caps, all sorts of barrier devices and condoms are a natural part of that. So the types of rubber that are involved in that um, have to be sealed down the edge with a seam. So if you're buying a condom in the 1870s, it wouldn't be disposable, it would be a kind of heavy, kind of thick, reusable thing, um, not very nice. The rubber improves a little bit when you get into the 20th century, but you're still dealing with quite a thick, heavy, reusable thing. And it's not really till the 20s, 30s, 40s that gradually the disposable condom comes in. So the point is that just because the disposable condom comes in, it doesn't, it doesn't mean everyone switches automatically. You know, there are many, many gentlemen customers who are used to the reusable condom, which is very cost effective. Um, so if you look after it, you know, you'll definitely get a few months out of it. You might get a couple of years. You've got to tend to it. You've got, you've got to powder it when you've used it. You've got to lay it out in a little box afterwards, and you've basically got to take care of it, make sure it doesn't perish doesn't get too exposed to oxygen um, and you know these these are not unpopular now I don't have figures on it that's that's the difficult thing I don't have figures on how many people were using this particular type as opposed to the disposable type um, but the the reusable condom that Jurex made was phased out in oh, about about 64 65 something like that they phased it out um, and why wouldn't you That's impressive that they lasted that long. Well, I mean, I think the thing is, Ben, you know, with, with the history of contraception, we've kind of been fed a bit of a narrative, particularly when it comes to the pill. And the narrative that we've been fed is that 
people have just been sitting around waiting for the technology to change everything. And as soon as the technology changes everything, people are liberated. And you certainly get that with a, a lot of writing about the contraceptive pill. Um, the reality is that when you look at when you look at how people shift their habits, it's not only generational, but a lot of it is generational. I mean, certainly with the oral contraceptive pill in the UK, people just didn't change their habits overnight. You know, it wasn't till 74, 75 that the pill overtook the condom. Um, with a new generation coming in that's a bit more receptive to, to new new techniques, new new things, having sex more, having sex more with more people. That's when you that's when you see the shifts alongside the technology. So I, I reckon there were just a lot of a lot of gentlemen out there in Britain who had been using the reusable condom for years and were didn't know any better and were very happy with it. And the pre-lubricated condom only came in in 57. So yeah, that's, that's not much of an overlap, but uh, yeah, I, I guess it must have been in demand if they were supplying it, but it's just really in your interests to get people into a, um, a, a bigger turnover of condom use, isn't it? I mean, estimates from Ernest Dicta Associates, um, which was what the, the British Dicta firms called, um, estimates in about 1961 were that the average man was having sex 90 times a year. So he could be having sex 90 times a year with one condom or with 90 condoms, possibly more. You know, so what would you choose as a business? <laughs> right. <Yeah>. So more. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's talk about uh, another difficult thing with this business, which is selling and advertising. <laughs> Oh, it was so difficult. What do you want to know? What are you willing to share? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's all in the book, Ben. It's all in the book. Um, there's so there's so many things going on. Um, so the first thing to say is that in America, advertising condoms uh, was really different. So you couldn't advertise contraceptives as consumer products in the States, but you could get away with marketing condoms because condoms were considered to be a prophylactic disease prevention, right? So that made, that put them squarely in the realm of a medical device. So that's the situation in the States. In the UK, we considered that it wasn't, proven that the condom did have prophylactic properties. That wasn't really established with any firmness in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. It was known to have some protective qualities, but it wasn't proved, it wasn't considered to be fail safe. So um, there was actually a law that said that you couldn't advertise medical devices for the prevention of venereal diseases because there were no, no known preventives in the early part of the 20th century and condoms fell into that category. So what that meant was that in the UK, condoms were marketed as family planning devices, which they could not be in the States. And in the States, the absolute reverse was true. So in the States, you could only advertise them as for the prevention of disease, which is what it says on the, on the packets when you look at vintage condoms, you couldn't do that in the UK. You couldn't do that. So it meant that the whole angle of advertising um, was, was different pretty much until things started to loosen up in the 60s and 70s. So up, that, up until that point, it was different. But it wasn't illegal to advertise contraceptives in the UK. It wasn't illegal to sell them. So um, in the 20s and 30s, uh, we, had, we had shops all over the place that had huge displays of contraceptives in the windows and, you know, bright sparkly packages and they they were really pitched as as consumer items um, and that started a chain of disapproval for various reasons among various parties not necessarily people who approved disapproved of of sex per se though a lot a lot of people did um, but you know there, there, there were genuine concerns um, that uh, people might be pressured into sex that they didn't want to have because um, contraception was so ubiquitous and you know it took some of the, the purpose out of sex you know if, if you 
think the purposes within marriage and procreation and all the rest of it. Um, and there was nearly a law enacted, there was nearly a law enacted restricting the sale of contraceptives, reining in that free market, reining in all of those little startups, those little enterprising entrepreneurs who were getting in on the contraceptive scene. Um, and that was designed to control contraceptive supply, put contraceptives in plain packaging, make them less dazzling. But that, that law was never actually enacted. So it was being read in the 30s. By the end of the 30s, we've got other more pressing concerns. By the end of World War II, um, no one's really interested in that law anymore. So what happens is that professional organizations start taking it up. And some of, some of those clauses in the proposed law, which never got enacted, started to get taken up by such bodies as the Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain, who imposed it on farms, uh, well, chemist shops, so that they could not advertise in their windows, you know, Jurex for sale here, they couldn't do that anymore. So restrictions actually came in from directions you wouldn't necessarily expect, and it became folded into advertising restriction in a vague roundabout sort of way, um, from the mid 50s when we first got commercial advertising in the UK. So strictly speaking, if you wanted to send a condom advert to a newspaper, you could do that. It wasn't illegal to send it off. It wasn't illegal for them to print it. But they, they mostly just didn't want to. Um, condoms were felt to be really distasteful. Nobody, nobody liked them. Nobody wanted to talk about them. They're disgusting. <laughs> um, they hadn't really enjoyed an association within the context of a loving family home. You know, they were thought of as things that were used by, as things that were used by prostitutes and their johns and nobody, nobody really wanted to advertise condoms. And then the pill came along and everyone wanted to talk about it, even if they couldn't advertise it. All of the newspapers, all of the magazines, television, everyone was talking about it. Um, and that that really upset the London Rubber Company. They were really annoyed about that. <laughs> yeah, the um, you know, gr growing up in the sort of fully modern post-AIDS world, uh, that was really interesting. The uh, push and pull between the London Rubber Company and their initial thoughts on the pill, when that's sort of sold to us now as like the peak of you know, protected sex, using both together. Yeah, double dutch, as we say over here, double, well, I'm actually in Virginia at the moment, so I'm not over here in London, but yeah, go going double dutch. Well, I mean, I, I, I guess what I learned from this research, Ben, you know, I went into it looking at the pill, and I went into it with a feminist hat on, and I soon discarded that feminist hat, not because I disagree with um, the tenets of feminism, but because I, I thought I needed to take a step back because so many of the histories of, of birth control um, come from a very narrow viewpoint, a very narrow perspective uh, that seems to have, has been, have been driven by the fact that the archives that we do have seem to be not for business. The archives that we do have are from the social enterprises that pushed for women's birth control in particular. So that would be Planned Parenthood in the USA and the equivalent, the Family Planning Association in Britain. So we can get at those archives, we can look at that material. It, it's, they've got thousands of stories to tell, um, but what we don't get is the commercial side. And the fact of the matter is that actually the, the charitable enterprises, the social enterprises, those very organizations that we have come to associate with a movement for birth control, they were a drop in the ocean. They were a tiny part of, of this whole picture and they were a tiny part of the market. And actually commercial organizations in the States, as well as the UK, I mean, there was, there was some really great long-standing old school condom firms operating in the States. Um, they had been slowly chugging away <laughs> for decades and decades and decades, quietly selling their products, not really being able to advertise. Um, and actually th that's, that, that was the marketplace for contraception. You know, the pill was a disruptor um, because it, it's, um, it, it, <sighs> 
it sanitized contraception. It made it really truly made it into a medical product. It was endorsed by doctors. It didn't have any of this back history with um, sex outside of marriage, with prostitution. The pill didn't have it had no baggage. It had no baggage. Um, and you know, we tend to think of it as this monolith, and it really was monolithic, but not necessarily in the way that we think. And that's that's why I shifted my own personal research really towards the business side. I realized that unless I understood how people expected to make money from this stuff and how that led to R&D and how they started to understand their, their customers um, and how they try to open up markets and find new customers, unless I started to understand that, I, I wasn't really going to get to the bottom of it. I think you asked me a question, but I've forgotten what it was. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Oh, never mind. I, I have a million and one follow-ups <laughs> now. Uh, something that's kind of been uh, tickling at the back of my mind for this whole time we've been discussing the broader topic of advertising. Uh, when it came time for the London Rubber Company to advertise when, when they could, uh, do you know if they did their ad work in-house or if they worked with an agency? Oh, well, yeah, this is, this is really interesting. So, um, in a roundabout sort of way, they always advertised, but they just couldn't do it through the conventional channels. So um, they would have little signs in chemist shops, that sort of thing. They would uh, produce booklets, copious amounts of booklets, like you wouldn't believe. Um, and they actually had a shell company that, that they did the booklets through. Um, and they had a number of shell companies in the 50s and 60s, which they used to put out benevolent sounding information on birth control, but was really from them. So, I mean, you would call that, probably you would call that a form of, of, of underground public relations rather than direct advertising, but they were always advertising in a way, and that was in-house for a very long time. Um, it's, they brought in some PR professionals towards the end of the 1950s. So that's just when public relations is becoming professionalized in the UK. You know, a few years later, Ernest Dixter sets up an agency in London, not very successful, closes mm -hmm. in a few years, but that's when public relations is becoming a thing. Um, and so they, they're keeping it in-house, but they're, they're, they're bringing outside people in um, to, 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 work, to work for them. So far as I can tell, it's really around about the 70s. They have a different, you know, they've got a change in strategy, they've got a management reorganization, um, then they start sending that advertising out and the advertising gets really serious in magazines, you know, very expensive, very glossy, um, very clever. Uh, but for them, for the main part in the early days, they were they were doing it themselves. And that was that was an uncommon. They had what was called, you know, propaganda departments, which you know most small businesses did. Um, but it was word of mouth, you know, once, once British, British soldiers were issued with Durex condoms um, in the Second World War from about 1942-43 with Durex stamped on them. I mean, that was all the advertising you need, really, in, in many ways, because that became synonymous with the condom. And as we know, condom users don't change their brands very often. So the goal of their advertising, um, once the pill had, came, had come in, was to grab a part of the market share, which was expanding because more people were becoming aware of birth control. You know, Ben, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, the most popular way of avoiding pregnancy in Britain was actually what's known as withdrawal or pulling out. Mm -hmm. um, coitus interruptus to be polite I mean that was the most widely used technique the condom came second after that I think the diaphragm which is the, the women's contraception that came after that so imagine that you've got a whole a whole swathe of people who are not buying any products at all so you want to convince them to buy a product that they have never considered so once everyone starts talking about the pill in the 60s and with the research that Dicta did the London Rubber Company decide to try and ride on the coattails of that conversation, which is really prevalent in the media. Everyone's talking about it. They can't directly say, buy your ex-condoms, they're great. 
they they won't mess with you know they won't mess with your body they're fantastic though they do say that but what they can do is try to um exploit that general interest in contraception that that's happening right and uh <clears throat> Since in your answer, you talked about some of the broader array of products they sold, uh, and also to tie this into uh, current news events in the United States, uh, I think you'd also mentioned that at least in the early days, they sold uh, Penny Royal. Oh, yeah. Well, um, I mean, to, to be honest, anyone who was in the contraception game also, you know, sold drugs for abortion. It was very normal. It was very normal. The pharmacists did it as well. Um, you know, it, you couldn't call them drugs for abortion, but we, we now know that's, you know, that's what was meant when it, they said penny royal, whether, you know, whether it can contain specific chemicals or, or not, it's difficult to know. But you just go through some of the catalogues with a fine toothed comb and you can find them hiding away at the back. Of course, it was not legal, um, but you would sell them under the guise of something else, like a regulator something like that. I think that was common in the States as well. Mm. Re regulate your menstrual you know, system. Um, you, you know, you, you have to infer what that's, what that's all about. But funnily enough, you know, I, I don't, I, I think, I mean, the London Rubber Company's position on abortion, um, it's a bit difficult to ascertain, but they did express one in the 1960s. Um, and they were actually a really family oriented firm. Now that doesn't necessarily mean you're against abortion, of course, but they were really family oriented. By that time, um, they were putting out lots of educational booklets with you know, pictures of happy families. Um, even members of the company and their own families and their own babies were used in films that the London Rubber Company was making because they had to have this family planning angle and they couldn't have a disease prevention angle, which they didn't really want to touch until the 80s anyway. Um, that, that was the way they went. It was all about family. So the idea to them of, I guess, supporting abortion, it wouldn't really have been congruent, but that's just me speculating. What I do know is that they put out um, uh, an article, an academic article, by a British academic called John Peel, who was on the books. So we didn't know that until recently. We, we looked at his papers from the 1960s and we used those as our main source for what was going on in contraception at the time. Those papers were written under the auspices of the London Rubber Company. He was on the payroll and he put out a paper about how the pill would likely increase incidences of abortion. So he didn't really say that abortion is terrible, um, but it was sort of inferred that it was undesirable and that this particular technique of birth control, because it was imperfect in the early 1960s, which was a line that they got from the dicta research, just say it's just say it's in development. It's not, you know, we haven't completed research on it yet. People are being experimented on, basically. Um, so he, he was inferring that um, uh, undesirable abortion was more likely when contraceptive users used the pill because they didn't know what was going on till the end of the month. And of course, with condom, you know pretty, pretty quickly if it's done its job or not. And that, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a thin argument, but that was an argument that they, they put out. Whether that's really reflective of the internal uh, dynamics within the company, I mean, that's, that's debatable, but that's definitely something they put out. You know, you really need to get in on these conversations wherever they're happening when you've got a product like the condom because no one wants to touch it. It's, you know, it's really, no one wants to touch it. Um, it has been likened to advertising napalm, toilet paper, funeral services, condoms. You know, these are all equated in that period of, of being the same kind of thing. They're, they're unmentionable in advertising terms. So irrespective of whether you agree or disagree with something really controversial that's going on, if you can just name check yourself as having some sort of position on it, then at least, you know, you get some airtime. Mm. It's a difficult situation. Yeah, I say it sounds like a very difficult needle to thread. 
Yeah, yeah, but but she, but you know they were really really successful for a long for a long time. Right. That's still the number one brand in Britain, Durex. Yeah, and eventually they do get around to attempting a pill. They didn't last very long. No, no. Oh, it was so short lived. It's very sweet, really. <laughs> So at the beginning of the said so the, the pill uh, came out in 1960, I think, in the States. In the UK, it came out in 1961. I think it was January 1961. Now, that doesn't mean you could just buy it in 1961. Um, first, it's available on private prescription. Then it's available through the National Health Service, only in very specific circumstances. You have to be married, you have to have kids already, that sort of thing. Then it becomes available through the charitable agencies. So the Family Planning Association, which is the equivalent of Planned Parenthood in the USA. Um, and then by about 1962, um, it's just it's a bit more widely advertised among doctors. Different types of pills start coming in. So that is to say, different brands with slightly different formulations, they might be aimed at the younger user or the more mature user, and they're still experimenting with the balance of estrogen and progesterone at that time. So between 1961, 1965, you actually get loads and loads of different brands of, of birth control pill in the UK. So the London Rubber, Rubber Company, towards the end of the 1950s, which is when the pill development is really coming to a close and they're getting ready to market it. Um, the London Rubber Company is watching with interest <laughs> and they hear about the pill, I think in about 58 or 59, I'd have to check the book, but it's towards the end of the 1950s. So they're getting wind of it and they're trying to get information about it, but it's quite difficult. So in the UK, the main, I would say the main distributor and regulator of the pill was not a government agency, it was the charitable organization, Family Planning Association. They were the ones who were really in charge of the pill in the UK for quite a long time. And they, they were not friends with the London Rubber Company. They did not get on. The London Rubber Company was always trying to use them. You know, it was trying to piggyback on their good name to sell its own product. It gave them loads of freebies. It supplied them with loads of resource. Um, it lent them their own PR man for about a year. That didn't go very well. But it was always lending resource to the Family Planning Association in order to ingratiate itself with them so that it could, it could benefit from their good name and this family friendly framing they wanted to give the condom. So when the Family Planning Association starts to be a bit more public about the fact that it's got this pill, in the pipeline and it's coming and we're going to be in charge of it. They almost get a kind of independence from the London Rubber Company in a way because London Rubber cannot touch this. They're not, they're not a pharmaceutical firm. You know, they, don't, they don't have that kind of scientist on, on the payroll. They've got no expertise. They don't, they don't even have the relationship with doctors, you know, ordinary GPs, everyday doctors outside of the Family Planning Association. They don't have any of that. They don't have that relationship. Their firm is not known to, to, to these people. Um, and I don't know if they're panicking. I don't think they're panicking. I don't know if they're just trying to find out more information. But what they do is they develop their own pill. And it's totally um, legit. It's tested they set up a little family planning clinic of their own very prestigious very prestigious uh, prestigious address near harley street um, they publish scientific papers on their pill they market it um, and they do everything that they're supposed to do until the family planning association kind of blocks it basically but i don't i don't think they ever wanted it to be successful because in a market like that, to just come in having never produced a medicine and trying to do that and thinking you're going to get ahead, I, I just don't think it's likely. I think that they started this whole pill project so that they could get on the inside of what was going on, so that they could understand it better, so that the Family Planning Association would actually have to listen to them because it was the Family Planning Association who would have to give 
their pill the stamp of approval um, before it could before they could, I mean, they could officially market it, but without the Family Planning Association's approval, that would be really difficult. They were the de facto regulators at the time. Um, so that's why, I that's why I think they brought it out. And, and I think it was all part of their research into trying to understand this new market, these new consumers, you know, this, this, this whole market of ladies that they hasn't had a great deal to do with in the past. Um, but they had been selling diaphragms since the thirties, but yeah. I mean, I mean, what do you think? You've had a look at the book. Do you think that adds up? Do you think there's something else going on there? Yeah, I, I'm going to have to ask a really like naive American question about this. Uh, hearing all of this talk about uh, drugs and pills and regulation and who gives people pills and who, whose stamp of approval goes where, how big of a role does the NHS have in this? Well, not much at that time, actually. The NHS doesn't really have a role to play in the, in the regulation of pharmaceuticals until the end of the 1960s, beginning of the 1970s. So you know, that there are certain restrictions that the, the NHS can't really um, buy the most expensive drugs. You know, it's always trying to get stuff that's off patent and that causes all sorts of problems. These are the nascent years of the NHS. I mean, just, just think about thalidomide, you know, mm thalidomide scandal which is happening at this time so far as i'm aware it affects the uk much much more badly than the us because it was reined in by the fda in the us that didn't happen in the uk the regulatory body to do that was not in existence you know it wasn't until you got you got all of those those babies born um that it became clear that there was a problem so with the pill um really because there was no body to regulate contraceptives specifically. And we're thinking about this in terms of a contraceptive, not just a pharmaceutical, um, but because it's a contraceptive, um, the Family Planning Association, they, they take the reins. They've been doing their own form of regulation for decades. They've got their own scientists. They've, they've got all those doctors on staff. They've got a little lab. They've got a lab that's shared by some American facilities as well in London. Um, and, and they take it upon themselves to decide which contraceptive pill gets their approval. Now, that doesn't mean that something they don't approve of is illegal. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that something they don't approve of can't, can't be sold. We do have the Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain that does some regulation on, on how medicines can be advertised and sold and you have to jump through certain hoops obviously you have to do clinical trials that sort of thing but it, the, the regulations are nowhere near as tight as it is today and the family planning association say it's contraception we've helped develop it by the way they helped develop it in britain so we we are going to be the arbiters on this and then another thing i have to ask about the company at this time why do they get into the photo photo development Oh, photo yeah. development. Yeah, this is so. So, for for the benefit of your listeners, the the downfall of the London Rubber Company, the the surprising and completely unexpected downfall, came about through colour photographic processing in the early nineties. That's that's how the company um, folded basically. Um, in the nineteen sixties, they had a management reorganisation. So. Up until, I don't know, 59, 60, 61, they're pretty much a contraceptives house, right? So condoms are their biggest product. Um, and that's really because once you've, once you've got all that, once you're tooled up, once you've got it all set up, they've got all this lovely patented in-house machinery designed by a Polish chemist called Lucien Landau, beautiful automated equipment. Once you're set up, you can make that stuff really cheap and you can sell it at a really high margin. So they are primarily a contraceptive house. Condoms are their main product. They're also selling things like uh, spermicide creams um, and diaphragms for women's use. And the diaphragms are really just a device to ingratiate themselves with the Family Planning Association and the women's market. But the point is, up to about 1960, they're a contraceptive house. Then they have a management reorganization and like loads of other companies in Britain, I mean, the 60s is a period of sort of big, booming business for the UK. It's really boom time for manufacturing. 
they decide to diversify. And with the pill on the horizon, it's quite, it's quite wise, really, because you don't know which way it's going to go at the, minute, the beginning of the 1960s. You know, you might get an effect like thalidomide in a few years. You just don't know. So at the beginning of the 60s, they diversify. And by about 65, 66, 67, they're really starting to get into other stuff. So some of the stuff that they got into um, was um, uh, they had irradiation plants. They were pioneers in surgical gloves. Rubber gloves were one of their important products, but disposable surgical gloves, those were new. So they were doing that at the beginning um, of the, the 70s, end of the 60s. Um, they got into irradiation plants, um, disposable underwear. That's one of my favorites. My other favorite is wine. They got into wine. Being able to buy wine just as a normal person for a normal meal in, in Britain was unusual in, in the 60s. Um, and they got into wine supermarkets. They even had their own cocktail bar at one point. Uh, they bought a brush firm that made brushes. So they got into brushes and molded plastics and all sorts of mad stuff. Uh, and they also got into photo processing. So that was at the beginning of the 70s. So through the 70s and the 80s, they got into some wild stuff, pottery, pottery. That did not work out well at all. Um, but all the time that they're getting into other products, their reliance on the condoms starts to go down. So the condom becomes a small, I mean, their business is growing and the, the proportion of that business that's taken up by the condom gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So when you hit the AIDS crisis in the 80s, I mean, to be very cynical for condom manufacturers, it's boom time, right? They're suddenly allowed to advertise on television, which they've never been allowed to do. There's all these competitors in the marketplace, again, very cynical, but all these competitors spring up because they can advertise. And at that time, they, they don't really expand the condom part of the business as much as you would imagine they would. So it's very steady, it's going along very nicely, but by the time you get to the 1990s, they're putting their eggs in different baskets and they're thinking photo processing. Yeah, people love photographs. <laughs> they like photographing themselves and their families, it's great. And, and they put a huge investment into this and they start to develop um, these, you know, one hour processing labs up and down the country, which I'm sure you had in the States, you know, a decade or 15 years maybe before we did, but they got into it in a big way. But in the early 90s, you get this huge economic recession. So I thought at first I thought, oh, yes, digital photography, that's what would have done it. But it wasn't. People didn't want to photograph themselves anymore. People weren't happy. They didn't have any money. <laughs> they, they weren't going on nice holidays. They weren't throwing nice parties that they wanted to remember because everyone was miserable. <laughs> and the, the bottom just totally fell out of the photographic market for a few years. And, and that's what did it. It didn't instantly kill London rubber, but over the next 10 years, it died a slow death because of those, those few years. It, it was really, it was devastating for them. But as to why they got into it in the first place, I guess it was just a growth industry in the early 70s. Much, much cheaper automatic cameras were coming in. People were having a great time, <laughs> not, not, not for the whole of the 70s, but you know, there was a heat wave in 1976. Everyone was taking photos, having a fabulous time. And it, it was a logical market to get into. I know we're we're fast approaching our time here today, but I, I think uh, this would not be a complete conversation, uh, at least in terms of my agenda for today. I don't know about yours. Uh, if we didn't talk a little bit about Lucian Landau. Uh, <laughs> I love that man. I love that man. I, I had the privilege of rediscovering Lucien Landau, who invented the technology behind the Durex condom. Um, and no one really knew about him and, until recently. And um, Lucien Landau was a Polish teenager who was sent to the UK by his family from Warsaw in the 1920s when we had a world leading rubber technology 
College in uh, North London. The North London Polytechnic contained this college. And his family were in the cosmetics and soap business. And you could see that rubber was fast becoming a part of, a part of that, sort of beauty devices and sp sponges, that sort of thing. So he was very young and they sent him over to get his education in rubber technology with the idea that he would go back to Warsaw, take all of that knowledge back to the family business, invest it in the family business, develop new products for them. But he loved London. He, he just, he had never really had that freedom before. I mean, he was not a sociable or pleasant man from what I can tell. I, I don't, I think he was quite a grumpy chap. But he was very taken with London. He loved to wander the streets. He loved to look in shop windows. He, he just, it was a different life for him. And he wanted to stay. So he tried to come up with a business idea. And, you know, he came up with some rubber oriented business ideas. Um, but at one stage, Pirelli, the firm Pirelli, sends some latex samples uh, over to his college for the students to mess about with, see what they come up with. And, and he has an idea. <laughs> and I'm sure you can guess what that idea was. And he starts making inquiries with some of the local chemist shops. And one of those chemists, uh, well, the, the guy who runs, the not an actual chemist, but a proprietor of a chemist shop, puts him onto his supplier, this guy called Lionel Jackson. And he runs the London Rubber Company. It's his company. But all they're doing is importing. When Lucien Landau comes on the scene and he's, oh, I'm a rubber technologist, I'm a chemist, I can develop this stuff for you. Lionel Jackson gives him money, sets him up in a factory in Hackney in North London, and they start to develop their own condoms. So they stop importing them. They don't need the American ones anymore. They're going to make them themselves, they're going to make them in-house. And Lucien Landau, over the years, particularly in the run-up to the war and just after the war, he develops this beautiful automated technology. I mean, there's, there's videos of it online and it's absolutely, it's like poetry. And of course you had that in America, but it was patented, you know, and London Rubber didn't want to buy anybody else's technology. So he designed it all in house, all himself. By the fifties, they're fully automated, but Lucien Landau's really unhappy. He's really unhappy. Um, Lionel Jackson, who was, his friend, they got on really well. He died in the 30s when he was really young. His family takes over. Lucy and Landau cannot stand them. He absolutely despises the, the Jackson family, doesn't like them at all. Things flare up. There are a few disagreements. And in 1950, he says, that's it, I'm leaving. He turns his back on London rubber. He never goes back and he becomes a psychic. And he starts channeling the dead, including his dead girlfriend. And he becomes, yeah, I know. It's really, it's very sad, actually. It's, it's, it's quite tragic. She was a switchboard operator at London Rubber. And, oh, it was a scandal. Um, and and she, she killed herself, unfortunately. And he was devastated. And in his grief, he seeks comfort and solace. And he, he, he starts to channel her. And he's got money. He's got all these expertise. He's used as a consultant by other people, but he leaves condoms behind and he's got a new life in the world of psychical research and the society of psychical research. Um, and after a few decades, he goes to live on the Isle of Man, which is a remote part of the United Kingdom. He gets into whiskey at some point, starts distilling whiskey. I haven't looked into that too much, but I should. And he's this wonderful, grumpy, unknown character who was a complete genius, <laughs> didn't ingratiate himself with many people in, in the business. And then with all of his earnings, went off and formed a whole new life and never looked back. So <clears throat> something else that I like to ask everybody uh, who I interview for this. Uh, yes, you know, so much archival work goes into putting together a book. Was there anything especially interesting, whether that's humorous, uh, strange, or just uh, a human interest story that you found in the archive that did not make it into the book that you'd like to share? Um, there, there was, there was, there was some, there was a custom service story which I quite liked. I don't think I mention it in the book. Um, 
I've looked through many archives, many, many, many papers, and the records of the Family Planning Association contain a lot of letters from people who were their clients, and they sold condoms mail order. And there was a there was a series of correspondence from a missionary, a mission, a British missionary in Africa, who was very upset because his London rubber company condom had failed and it had resulted in his wife's pregnancy, which was an unwanted pregnancy. Um, that's not really very amusing. It's not funny at all, but he did send the product back. And that bit I find very interesting. And there's a whole correspondence about this. So um, he writes to the Family Planning Association and complains. They say, we, we're gonna forward this to our supplier. We're not dealing with it. So they forward it to their supplier, London Rubber. London Rubber, somebody quite high up actually, the managing director, Angus Reid, um, who seems to deal with a lot of these complaints personally. He says, send it to us and we'll have a look at it. So he does. And this is not uncommon. Sending the product back when it doesn't work is not uncommon. Um, apparently they tested it and it looked fine. I, I, I don't have any details of how that worked or how, how they did it. The actual item itself is not in the correspondence, which I was glad about in a way. But uh, yeah, I, I just love that level of customer service. I thought, I thought that was great. Their confidence in their product was, was really high, <laughs> was really high. There was a lot of science behind it. And they were certainly not going to accept that something had failed without some sort of human error, which is how I believe they, they res well, they didn't resolve it, but they put it down to human error in the end. <laughs> so um, for someone who might be a, a part of our a more casual audience for these history hangouts. Uh, what would you want them to take away from reading your book? I, I guess the, the one takeaway I would want to give any reader, whether they're a casual reader, someone who's just interested, or, or whether they're, you know, a hardcore researcher who's written books on this stuff themselves, is that this is the whole issue of contraception birth control, you can put abortion in that as well. It is not one dimensional. You will hear the political arguments again and again, and they are a tiny part of the story. Uh, it's a very, very complicated picture. And it's not just complicated on the basis of human emotions or morality or religion or ethics. Those things all come into it. But sometimes you can explain things by very, very cold commercial realities. And that is the one takeaway that I would give to your readers to always, uh, or your listeners rather, or my readers, if I get any, but <laughs> it's just to consider the, the bigger picture. And some people find business very distasteful. They don't like the idea of commerce, but it's actually an integral part of this story in the USA and in the UK. It decides what gets made, what doesn't, what's get, what, what gets marketed, what doesn't, who gets targeted, who doesn't, and the political activists that you will hear the most from often have the least to do with the development of, of this stuff. That's, that would be my takeaway. Well, thank you for that. And I would encourage anyone who's interested to go out and pick up their own copy. Yeah. Uh. Here it is. It's got a lovely cover and great yes. pictures. And here's mine. And I yes, <laughs> yes, those pictures are great. Uh, I don't want to tell them about them. I want them to encourage. I want to encourage everybody to go get the book. Good pictures, really good pictures. <laughs> All right. So if I might take a uh, moment again to speak to our audience. Uh, if you'd like more Hagley History Hangouts and more information on the Center for the History of Business Technology and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library, then join us online. You can visit us at hagley.org. That's H-A-G-L-E-Y dot O-R-G. And thank you for joining us today. And thank you for sitting down to be interviewed today. It's my pleasure, Ben.
forward. 